Well, good morning to everybody in Singapore and good afternoon to all my friends in, um, in Australia. This is Scott Morrison. I'm the CTO of Layer 7 Technologies and this is Beyond MDM. The five things that you must do, you must do them to secure mobile devices in the enterprise. So listen, thanks a lot for joining me today. A um, couple of housekeeping things I want to get rid of just right up at the front end. Um, if you have any questions, I'll try to get to them near the end of it. Um, I'm going to speak for probably about 30 minutes or so. Um, but chat any questions you've got. And, uh, and one of my kindly assistants here will, uh, will try to collate them. And if I can't get to them live, um, what I'm going to do is... Uh, is I'll follow up directly with you. So by all means, get us whatever questions you want. Um, we've got a hashtag as well. Uh, for those of you on Twitter, it's um, hash L7 webinar. And if you want to follow any of us uh, over here at Layer 7, of course, take a look at the uh, Layer 7 account. Um, and also myself, K. Scott Morrison, uh, where we're tracking all sorts of interesting trends in mobility, uh, interesting trends in the API world, and, uh, and also what's going on in the cloud these days. So listen, let's let's get into this. Let's let's talk a little bit about this mobility stuff and uh, and what it's all about. So number one, you're probably thinking, you know, I, I've got mobility. What do I need more mobility for? I've had a laptop since 1995. I've been carrying one of these things around, and and I'm totally mobile. You know, I, I get my email on it. I can uh, access um, you know disks and files and things like that back inside my enterprise using VPNs. I've got basically all those components that I need. And, and, and truth be told, all of us do this. I mean, all of us are pretty well set up for this kind of mobile computing. But of course, the really interesting mobile computing that's happening now is really different. And, and fundamentally, it's about this, this amazing change agent that we've begun to see um, that's really the forcing function for a whole new way of doing mobility. And of course, that's the phone that's in your back pocket. It's the tablet, it's the iPad, or the, um, you know, the Android-based tablet. And, and what's interesting about these devices um, isn't that they're really new, of course, because we've had most of them for a number of years now. What I think is really, really interesting here is that we really have to look at the whole mobile security problem differently. And, and I think the danger that we're faced with these days is that we try to graft old solutions onto this new technology. So in other words, we try to learn from what we did in the classic mobility use case of somebody sitting in front of their laptop, and we try to take that same experience and graft it onto one of these devices. And if there's anything Apple has taught us about these handheld devices, is that you can't think of them, you can't work with them, you can't build apps that are the same as basically what you've got in, in, in the classic you know, laptop world, the classic computing world. These things are different, and they fundamentally have to secure transactions differently. They have to come up with a different way of actually getting into the enterprise and that. And that's that's really fundamentally what we're talking about. So what's interesting as well is that if you start to look at the trends that we're seeing in uh, in technology right now, um, if you go to Google Trends, I, man, I love Google Trends. I mean, when they came out with this thing, um, this is just a gold mine for trying to sort of tap into whatever the zeitgeist is right now in, in certain topics in computing. And if you compare mobile security versus laptop security, you see a really interesting trend. I mean, laptop security is flatlining. I mean, it, we know everything about laptop security that we're going to know. There's not much new happening there. There are standard procedures, there are standard best practices that all of us can do in that. And so there's, there's not a lot going on there. Okay, we're, we're sort of building off of 15 you know, plus years of, of, of experience there. But mobile security in general, uh, or in, in real contrast here, is, is really significantly different. We're seeing a real spike there. And, and that's really been over the last couple of years. So, so clearly this is hitting a nerve. I mean, what's happening is that a lot of people are suddenly realizing that, that maybe you know, the, the techniques they thought they'd be able to rely on, those techniques that you know, were the fundamentals of, of laptop security aren't going to work anymore. And so they're going out on the internet and saying, help me. You know, what am I going to do? How am I actually going to deal with this? So, so let's think about the, the sort of perspectives a little bit. And, and, and let's think a little bit about sort of old thinking and, and new technology. Because we've got this new technology in, in that. And, and, and what I want to try to do is sort of characterize, I think, how the old style of thinking is, is really affecting the way that people are doing mobility right now and how that may not be the right thing um, going forward in the future. Okay, So the first thing to ask yourself is, is, is a tough one. Okay, this is, this is a bit of a rhetorical question, which is who owns mobile? And, and the, the truth is, 
There's not a lot of good answers to this thing. I mean, mobile is all over the place. I, I talk to a lot of carriers. I talk to a lot of enterprise customers and that. And, and it always seems that mobility is this, this ugly stepchild that gets kind of thrown into different parts of the organization. But one thing is clear. The, the drivers for mobility tend to come from the executive suite. And this is really in contrast with, with what happened with mobility. So, so think about it this way. Every single CEO of any company of significance, you know, probably has some kind of a smartphone in there, you know, uh, or else maybe a BlackBerry or something like that. You know, I say that as a, as a, as a, as a bit of a joke to a very beleaguered Canadian company. But um, everybody has, you know, one of these things. And, and most of, you know, the change agents in, in any kind of organization, you know, these, you know, these, these high-level executives and that, can basically, you know, come in and say, I want some, I, I want access. Like, I want this thing to be able to get access into, into my um, uh, internal data. And you know what? I mean, my dad's company is a great example of this. He, he runs, you know, a small sales um, um, company, like a, basically a manufacturer sales rep company, about, a, you know, 15 people here in Western Canada and that. And, um, and he's got a lot of people, you know, distributed over several time zones and that, <clears throat> and, and, and a pretty big territory to deal with. And of course, he comes by one day and, and shows up with, a, with, with an iPad and says, yo, I, I like this thing. I think it's going to be great. It's going to revolutionize how my guys in the field are going to be doing their business. And, and so he decides to start distributing these things out to, uh, you know, to his field uh, um, sales guys. And, and you can imagine what happened. It's like absolute bloody chaos out there because, of course, he just sort of dumps these things in the hands of the field guys and they don't know what to do with them. They have no way of, of really getting access to, you know, the core data that they need, you know, back behind the firewall in his small organization. And that's a small business. So imagine the same thing happening, you know, within larger enterprises and that. And what's interesting is that wasn't what happened, you know, 15 or 20 years ago during the laptop revolution. I mean, the CEO didn't buy a laptop and come in and say, you know, this, this newfangled laptop thing is going to take off. I want everybody to have one of these. I mean, the laptop was a trickle-up thing from IT. So IT had more control from the very beginning and got to sort of decide what the right thing to do was. But in the end, you know, the person who wears this, the group that ends up wearing this, um, really always is IT. IT are the people that have to sort of, you know, get some kind of, of you know, order out of the chaos. Um, and, and it's especially acute when it does come from on high, when you get this sort of, this forcing function coming from the executive suite. So in a lot of ways, what we're seeing, which I think is a real significant problem these days, is a bit of a knee-jerk reaction, which is, I've suddenly, you know, been given a bunch of, of uh, mobile devices, you know, out there in the field that I have to be able to support. What am I gonna do? And, and what people have been doing is that they've been kind of looking towards the classical security model that worked so well in the laptop world. And when you think about that, that, you know, that ultimately starts with the directory. I mean, it starts with whatever directory you've got, whether it's a generic LDAP directory, whether it's from Oracle, whether it's Active Directory from Microsoft, doesn't matter. Somewhere we've got, you know, this idea of who the internal users are. And, and, and stop and think about that word internal. Because the classic security model has always been about serving just you know, the people who work for the corporation. And, and keep that in mind and, and table that for a few minutes because I'm going to come back to that point in a minute. But, but really the classic foundation of, of the security model is, is the directory. And then layered on top of that, of course, is our IAM systems, the identity and access management uh, systems, which, which deal with, with sort of the next level of, of management and problems, um, you know, that come up when you're trying to deal with access control using directories. So. IAM systems are a tremendously mature marketplace right now. <clears throat> there's lots of them out there. Um, you know, there's a lot of very good ones. It's an extremely competitive space. But basically, IAM, you know, deals with the, the individual access control for, you know, different protocols and that, whether it's HTTP coming in on our browser or, you know, whether it's um, um, everything from, you know, JDBC or ODBC connections into, into um um, databases and things like that. You know, IAM is there providing scaffolding, you know, around the directory so that you can manage accounts and users internally. So there's that word again, okay? And then the final piece of that puzzle really has always been the VPN. I mean, the classic, you know, usually SSL in that VPN, but sometimes IPsec, that, that is a heavyweight client that runs on, you know, the, the classic mobile device, the, the laptop, like the one that I'm broadcasting from right now. So, that's the knee-jerk reaction that sort of gets grafted in a lot of cases onto 
mobility. That's what you know. A lot of IT shops have said, you know what, this works really well. We've got tremendous experience with it. You know, we've been kind of, we've got that 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 flat line of interest going through Google Trends and that. And um, you know, so clearly we know how this works. So let's try to graph the same solution onto mobile devices. And so the thing we've got to ask ourselves is, is this the right solution? So if you take these same components, you know, my my directory, my IM, my VPN. And, and you try to graph that onto a solution for mobile devices. Is this the right solution or not? And, and the answer that I would you know, hazard a guess based on a lot of experience in talking to people who've, who've tried this is no. Because truth be told, there's a lot more um, stuff going on that isn't necessarily captured in the directory and I am combination. And when I say stuff going on, I mean there's a lot more complexity to identity, to who you are, to you know what kind of identities you're actually going to be using coming in that is necessarily captured in the classic internalized directory. And of course, VPNs, there are VPN clients, you get them for free on most of your devices. There's certainly one that comes out on my, you know, my Apple iPhone and, and um, you know the same one is available on my my iPad. Um, Android-based devices have you know, internal VPN clients too. And there's a lot of companies that will gladly sell you that, that specialized combination of VPN server plus client-side apps that you know can run on one of the mobile devices. But part of the problem is when you start to put all that together is number one, it's not a great user experience. And and remember, user experience is an incredibly important part of that whole mobile experience. It's not just, you know, about, you know, kind of forcing your users into one, you know, simple pattern that they do again and again and again. Um, I think mobility is very, very much about being an enabler of getting information in, a, in sort of a new way. And the VPN just kind of stands in the way of that. It, it's not a very good user experience. And, and furthermore, the problem is, is that the VPNs are very non-discriminatory in, in that they, they tend to make these connections that let all different apps and that start to get, you know, complete and unfettered access into back-end services. And in a lot of cases, that, that's okay. But in a lot of other cases, it isn't. And so the first thing that people started to think about when, when these came out is, is how can I start to you know, get better authorization of my different apps? So I can create segmentation between apps that may be you know, related only to um, uh, my work life as opposed to the apps that are in my personal life. And, and that's a very common in like sort of situation these days because the whole BYOD revolution, the bring your own device revolution is really about allowing users to choose, allowing users to choose what mobile device they want and what they want to, what they want to use. And if you buy into that, you've got to also, you know, make a sort of a, a separation between a work life and a, and a personal life as well. And that actually begins to get pretty complicated. And so flooding into this space were a whole bunch of manufacturers that, that gave you an additional layer of management called mobile device management, or MDM. And MDM basically gave people that ability to create different containers, different profiles on the device. So it kind of segmented it up. And the most common segmentation, of course, is just sort of two profiles, you know, personal and, and, and work. But of course, most of them will give you other ones. Um, and that, that was okay, you know, because that, that actually allowed you to then start to say, these are the authorized apps. These are the ones that I'm, allow, you know, going, I'm going to allow to get access into my internal you know, network. And then the user is still allowed to, you know, download their personal apps, whether it's, you know, games like Angry Birds and stuff like that or productivity or whatever. It doesn't matter. There's a, there's a church and state separation here. And, and that's a good thing. And, that. and, and in fact... I don't want to come in here saying there's something wrong with MDM because I don't think there is. And in fact, I think MDM is actually a really good solution. And I think a lot of the solutions out there are, are absolutely worth pursuing. Um, it is a very competitive space. And, and you know, if you're going out there to look for an MDM solution, take your time because it's changing really, really fast. And some of the early incumbents um, are getting quickly eclipsed by, you know, some really interesting new solutions here. And of course, MDM also deals with a lot of other stuff that, you know, if you want to reach out and, and start to control devices, you really need as well. And, and that's things like, you know, automatic configuration of the VPN or Wi-Fi settings. And, you know, it's, it's, it's to deal with things like backup management and, and, and such. Um, 
And moreover, it also deals with some of the underlying persistence layer on the device itself, so that you can do selective device wipe or selective wipe of certain apps and things like that. So all, all good things that if you want to create this separation of control between personal and, and, and um, um, enterprise app, you really do fundamentally need. So, so MDM is good. Okay, so MDM is, is, is getting us in the right direction now. But MDM, I would postulate, may not be enough. And that's really fundamentally the message I want to leave you with here. So MDM is a good start, but I think in the end, MDM is kind of halfway. MDM gets us, you know, a lot of the basic pieces in terms of containerization and remote wipe and, you know, um, uh, provisioning of, of identities and things like that. But what MDM doesn't necessarily do well, I don't think, is, is institute sort of a new style of thinking that fits better with the sort of the modern app-centric model of the world. And that's what I want to talk about now. I want to talk about instead of like old thinking and new technology, I want to think about new thinking on new technology. I want to think of a new approach to you know, how you can actually begin to create secure access you know, into the enterprise that's going to delight your users, that ultimately is going to solve these, these sort of fundamental security problems, but not in a way that becomes a barrier, not in a way that actually stops your users from, from actually getting access to what they need. So this is, this is the foundation of that. And, and, and this is a simple observation that I think, you know, underpins the whole thesis here, is that it's about the app. Problem with MDM is it isn't about the app. MDM is about the device. So MDM is about like locking that device down and creating different profiles in that device and creating sort of the, the containers and managing the persistence layer of the device, managing the way the device interacts under certain policies and that, managing passwords and stuff like that. All good things. All good things, mind you. But, but what I want to make you consider is that maybe what we should be doing is thinking about the app itself. Because really... You know, mobile devices are about the app. I mean, that was the genius, I think, of, of, of you know, the whole mobile revolution that, um, you know, that I would argue that uh, Apple kicked off and, uh, and a lot of other, you know, groups such as Google have really run with and, and expanded on even further. And it is about the app. I mean, the focus is on, you know, what you can do with the app itself beyond just the device. It should be, be one of these situations where, where, in a sense, the device just sort of fades away. And your entire interaction, your entire sort of user experience is, is really that thing about the app. So what I want you to do then is kind of reframe that thinking and, and, and to start to consider that maybe what we really need to do is rather than thinking about giving the device access into the enterprise, giving the device the ability to, you know, make some kind of secure tunnel into the enterprise and then just letting woo -hoo, all the apps, you know, just like run over that, you know, at least all the apps that are in, let's say, the enterprise container of your MDM system. What if instead we started to think about it on an app-by-app -app basis? You know, because all apps have different requirements in terms of what they need to get access to. So the app itself should in some ways define the access control and the, the actual authorization of who's getting access to what. So different focus here. And the different focus, of course, is going to lead to sort of a lot of different insights into, into how we should be approaching this problem. And one of those insights is maybe the real owners are app developers. So maybe it isn't about like, you know, this lost ownership um, that we've run into where you know, maybe it's it's somewhere under the CEO's group, or you know, it's it's you know the marketing group that's owning mobile or or whatever. But but maybe the, the fundamental people that we should be thinking about as as core owners here are app developers. You know, and maybe these these people should become like in a lot of ways these these new important power brokers. So this idea then of of putting the focus back on the apps and 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 making sure that the app itself can be secured is is really one of the the, the core new challenges uh, that we've got to face. So, so let's think about some of the things that you know we're going to be up against here. And and one of the obvious ones is that identity is this huge crux issue now. So, so ask yourself this: like when I sign on in in one way or the other through some app and and, and get access to some enterprise data through that app. And 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 trust me, a lot of organizations are doing this right now. They're they're putting iPads out in the hands of their their mobile workforce and, and hopefully a little more effective than my dad's organization. And uh, and these guys are actually getting access to, to um, you know, live uh, um, 
uh, customer relationship data and things like that. They're all, you know, traditionally locked up behind a firewall. But they can get it, boom, instantly, you know, regardless of where they are. Very cool thing. A lot of our customers are doing this. But, but here's the problem, and here's the thing that a lot of these companies are facing, is, is, is the identity issue, which is as that user comes in, as that, let's say, salesperson who's sitting maybe in um, you know, a doctor's office because they're a drug salesman and they're you know, talking to that doctor about you know, the latest great new um, patented drug that they're going to be selling and, um, and, and then they want people to be using it, but they're also, you know, while they're talking, getting access to, to um, you know, uh, internal records about you know what they've been able to interest that doctor before in and all sorts of stuff like that like you know really interesting customer relationship data kind of stuff um, so so when they sign on are they signing on as that person like are they that identity like you know that person or are they signing on as the app or, or maybe is it both and so the thing that we've really got to ask ourselves now is that identity is much more than just this simple idea of a name Identity is now this whole big context, this whole series of, of assertions and attributes about a name. It's, I'm, I'm a name, I'm, I'm, I'm the de particular device. It's a particular app that's, that's accessing um, um, uh, some kind of back-end data, some kind of back-end resource inside the enterprise. It's a location, it's a jurisdiction, it's a moment in time. All of this, every single one of these and more, are all grist for the mill in making access control decisions. So all of a sudden with mobility, you've got this sense that it's more than just the person. You know, and, and bear in mind, remember classic mobility, sitting down at your, your laptop, getting a VPN connection into the enterprise? That was about you. That's your name. That's your credential, your username and your password, maybe your certificate, if you happen to be using um, you know, uh, stronger authentication. But in the end, that's about a person. Mobility is different, though. Mobility has a lot of different factors because mobility, you know, could have issues where all of a sudden somebody's using an app that you really can't use when they cross into a different jurisdiction. A great example of that is I've got customers that are actually doing gaming apps, you know, like online gambling and stuff like that, where it's actually going out to mobile devices. And because of certain regulations and that, because of the current regulatory environment in certain countries, um, quite literally when they're in one county versus the other, they may be able to use that app and then they step across a line and boom, they can't use the app anymore because they're in a different jurisdiction. It's an interesting problem. So all this stuff is important grist for the mill and that. The other interesting thing about identity, of course, is that, that all of a sudden there's a lot of new roles. Cast your mind back. Remember I was talking about internal identity. This is where I'm bringing this back. Internal identity are all those people over there on the right. You know, all those, you know, good button-up enterprise um, 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 you know, employees and such like that, that are all in that internal directory. But the minute you move out into mobile devices, you're starting to face a lot of other problems with things like the identity of developers who are building iPhone apps, who actually get access to certain, you know, credentials or keys, which then bind into apps themselves. So there's a lot of these, these new people, these new identities, these new roles, that all of a sudden when you get out of the mobile world, especially if you're moving in a very fast and agile manner where you're trying to push a lot of apps and things like that out there, that you've got to deal with. And these aren't people that you necessarily want in your internal directory. So think about this, like you've probably got a Google account, for instance, let's say you have a Gmail account or something like that. What did it take for you to get that? Well, I mean, you filled out a little form and you maybe answered a CAPTCHA to make sure you weren't a robot, and then they gave you, you know, an account, okay? So you were, you were provisioned right there. Now ask yourself this, do you think that, you know, that, that account is captured in the same directory as the internal Google users? And the answer is probably no, you know, I actually don't know this for a fact, but you can probably guess that they're not mixing these two things together. There is another of these church and state separations here. But nevertheless, you still have to be able to manage both of these. So what is interesting about all of this is, is you know, the sum total of this, you know, this problem of, of lots of attributes going into identity, lots of context going into identity, lots of different relationships that need to be managed, not just the internal people, but also external people, developers, users, etc. All of these have to be sort of you know, managed effectively in sort of one cohesive unit. And mobility, mobility, the modern mobility of, of that phone in your pocket, that's the forcing function that's bringing all of this together. And the really cool thing that's going on right now is it's precipitated a tremendous change in terms of focus. Like the old enterprise was all about this idea of central identity management. Like the users were internal, they were behind the firewall and, you know, they were people 
you know, uh, who the enterprise had absolute control over. They were the employees. Now the new mobile enterprise is sort of making this shift to these outside users where there's a lot of different relationships. Some of those may be very ephemeral relationships, like a developer that you hire for a few days to, you know, build a very, very simple little um, 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 iPhone app or something like that. Uh, that solves an important problem, but nonetheless you have a very short relationship and lifespan with that person. And what's interesting is, is many of the new techniques in identity, and I'm speaking specifically about, you know, movements like OAuth and OpenID Connect, which are very, very important in the, in the um, um, uh, mobile arena, are really about this shift where it's going from that central cabal of internal, you know, directory um, um, administrators who, if you had wanted any change made to that internal directory, you had to go up to these people and, you know, ask them nicely and fill up forms and triplicate and stuff like that. It's moving towards this idea where all of a sudden the user, the owner of the, the core identity, the owner of that core name, is getting control over the relationships. They're the people that are allowed to make those connections between relationships. They're the people that are allowed to tie things together. And they're the people that decide on which accounts are actually, that they own, of course, are getting access to what resources. And that's a tremendous shift. That's a, like a sea change. That's a mind shift that's, that's really, really significant. Um, because really, it's, it's how we're going to do identity in the future. It is, this is how identity scales. Okay? It's not about just adding more administrators to the, the identity and access management, the IAM system in the directory. It's about pushing it out to the users themselves. It's a profound idea, really, really important. OAuth is not about just another security token. OAuth is really about this idea, this movement, this change in focus in responsibilities here. And so this is something that we actually have to accommodate in, in you know, this, this whole, um, you know, kind of new world of, uh, of mobile devices. And the other thing, of course, that we've got to worry about all the time is securing data. I mean, this comes up again and again and again. And there's really two things you've got to think about. One is the data in transit. So, you know, if you're transferring, you know, some kind of important, let's say, customer data, um, and, or, you know, or what have you, the big thing you've got to worry about is the classic man in the middle sort of scenario where all of a sudden somebody in there can either you know see personally identifiable information or information they're not allowed to get access to or even change it in transit. So we, we need confidentiality and integrity here and, and we need some kind of encrypted channel because you know the the the, the whole you know last ten years of of the whole WS Star and SOAP and web services um, uh, movement, which you know gave us very very complex standards that were very in a lot of ways very unusable in in the modern you know um, constrained device world. Um, it went down that whole path of trying to you know individually encrypt different you know, and 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 secure you know different fields and things like that. And you know what, that data based encryption just doesn't work very well. The, the, the modern approach to doing it that makes sense on mobile devices is back to channel encryption. It's back to SSL TLS, which was a great solution. I mean, you know, it took three versions of SSL and then, you know, a few refinements on TLS to get it right. But, but eventually we did get it right. It's not easy. It's a lot of chances to make mistakes with this stuff. There's a great paper out that came out, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, six or eight weeks ago or something, I think. Um, and... Uh, um, you know, talking about SSL and how people are still screwing it up on the client side. People are misusing it all over the place. And they actually looked, they did a survey of, of um, um, API, client side API stubs that had to use SSL. And, uh, and a lot of the big ones for very popular APIs out there, everything from, you know, uh, uh, Amazon Web Services to a whole bunch of other ones. And they, and, and, and they found a surprising amount of misconfigurations in those libraries and, and just, you know, bad practices where people weren't validating certs and people weren't following cert change properly and they weren't looking at the whole context of the cert and the trust relationship and all this stuff. So, so SSL isn't perfect, SSL TLS isn't perfect, but it's a pretty good solution if you spend the time on doing it right. Now data on the device of course is the, the perennial thing that people worry about all the time and, and what's so interesting about this is is that Mobile devices, when you look at it, mobile operating systems actually are, are arguably some of the most secure um, systems we've ever built because they actually built a very strong security model in from the very beginning. You know, this whole idea that, that you know, you'd create silos where an app could, you know, interact with its own persistence layer but not with the persistence layer of another app. Like, there's no way those two can cross. It's like they're internally firewalled, if you can imagine that. Um, 
and uh, that's that's actually a great thing. I mean, you know, we that that in itself stops a lot of you know sort of classic hacks and viruses and you know attack vectors that have plagued you know classic operating systems, whether they're you know Windows or Unix um, based or or what have you, um, you know, through all time. I mean, this this approach, which is common both to iOS and uh, and Android and uh, and even some of the other um, um, technologies, um, is actually really profound because it's very very secure. But nonetheless, nonetheless, data on the device can still be a problem. Like if you have, let's say, you know, data that you've synchronized on that device that that all of a sudden you know you um, may be compromised because somebody steals your phone or you lose it or something like that. And, and so there's two ways of approaching this problem. And, and one obviously is, don't do this. <laughs> one obviously is, try as you might, like don't build apps that persist locally. Build apps that instead get live feeds and, and make sure it's very transient. Like throw the stuff away when you're done with it. And that's actually a surprisingly good approach. Obviously we don't do that with email and stuff like that. But a lot of other apps we actually can. Because remember, we, we have to make that decision every time. Are we going to synchronize or not? Email is a synchronization-based technology. But a lot of the other ones don't have to be. Because these are always on devices. And yeah, sometimes when the door closes on the airplane, we have to shut off our radios. Um, you know, we won't be able to get access to, you know, the latest and greatest data. Or maybe even not see any of the data that's, that's hidden behind your corporate firewall. But, you know, maybe that's a small price to pay for a lot of peace of mind. And now, of course, MDM solutions are pretty good at coming in there and being able to create remote wipe environments and things like that. And so that's, that's why I'll, I'll never be dismissive of MDM, because I think MDM is a very important solution. But as I said before, MDM's half of it. So, so data on the device can be solved really in two ways. One, you can rely on the MDM um, technology to be able to do selective wipes and things like that. And, and, and those solutions are pretty good at dealing with that kind of thing. And that's a good way of dealing with things like, you know, email and stuff like that. Um, but, but for new apps, you know, my, my advice, and, and I think the important best practice that people should be considering, is this idea that instead you, you just work with transient data. You don't keep stuff around, because there's really not a, a good reason in a lot of ways to do that. So, so we've, we've talked about problems. We've talked about identity and this explosion of new identities that we've got to deal with. Um, and we've talked about data. And the problems that you know we may have to face in data. So, so given that, given that that sort of issue that's coming up again and again, what are the strategies? So here's the the, the money shot, people. Here's what here's where I, what I'm coming up to. If you take this app centric approach, where where really in the end you you stop thinking about just the device and instead you move up the stack and think about securing the apps. Here's how you do it. Okay, what you need is a mobile access gateway. Okay, so you need, a, you need a device that is very API-centric, okay? Because the way apps are accessing, you know, back-end data is going to be through the API movement, which is really just a, a consolidation of the ideas of REST, added in there, you know, a little pinch of JSON as a data type, um, you know, and, uh, and a little shake of, uh, of uh, OAuth uh, as a way of uh, authorization, and maybe even some OpenID Connect in there if you need it. But but you know, bringing these things together, APIs, the whole API movement that, that started out in social networking, but it started to percolate in all throughout the enterprise now. You know, that's the approach you're going to take. And and what you need then is is a device like a mobile application gateway, which is really a proxy, a secure proxy that applies policy to APIs. So it becomes that border guard. It becomes that sort of first point of contact. So when an app makes a connection to get access to a back-end API server, it's not going through a VPN. It's making a secure connection on its own and going through a gateway that then can deal with all of the problems that I've talked about. It can deal with like the, the, the rich context of modern identity, which can be who am I? What app have I, am I coming in on? What device am I coming in on? Where am I? What time is it? All of these attributes. It can start to make those kinds of access control decisions. It can look for threats that may be coming in, um, you know, based on, on people trying to abuse the API. It can deal with things like SSL termination and, and, um, and ensuring that, that connection is, is being you know, is using, you know, what is quite frankly the best practice right now for um, uh, doing secure connectivity. Not throwing it all through, you know, a big heavyweight VPN, which is difficult to manage and, and 
you know, very, not app centric, more device centric, and instead now making connections on an app by app basis and and securing those from an SSL TLS perspective in what in whatever way makes sense for that app. Because remember, every API call. Every API call may have different requirements, and you need to tune to those requirements. And that's exactly what things like a mobile access gateway do. The next piece of the puzzle is to sort of think about the different constituencies, the different groups you've got to manage. Because remember I was saying earlier, it's not just about the internal users anymore. You know? And even those internal users, of course, are much more the than the internal user they were before. You know, now it's about um, um, you know, the whole list of attributes and context that they're coming in with. But, but the other thing you've got to consider, too, is the app designers and app developers and the people with whom you have a very, very short, transient relationship with. You need to be able to s support them. You need to be able to allow them to get access to the keys so that they can build apps. You need to be able to manage them. You need to be able to, you know, terminate their access once their um, contracts are up. And, and what we find with a lot of our customers, and these are big enterprise customers, these are governments, um, you know, these are telcos and people like that who are doing exactly this, who are starting to deploy a lot of different mobile apps, is that, you know, the big thing that they need is they need not just to in manage the internal um, users, they need to manage those external relationships and, uh, and, and moreover, give those external developers the tools that they need to get their job done, which means give them the accounts give them the documentation so that they know what APIs are available and how to access those. Give them a sandbox so that they can play with the APIs safely and securely before they actually deploy their actual production um, apps out uh, maybe you know through an app store whether it's a commercial one or whether it's a you know private app store. And the third piece, the last piece of this puzzle is really making it easier on that client side for app developers to be able to to access these internal systems. Now, everything I'm talking about here in terms of these, these red lines, these transactions, these, these connections are all standards based. Like you should not be doing proprietary protocols there. You should be basing this on you know, standard API best practices. You should be using TLS, SSL. You should be um, using OAuth. You should be using OpenID Connect and stuff like that. So absolutely, you do not want to go down and, and have you know, one vendor come to you and say, oh, we've got this, these magic beans it'll make all of your connections perfect and it'll just go away and you don't have to worry yourself about it. You know, you should just run like hell if somebody just says that to you. Instead, what you should be using though, because the thing is building the client side part of that is, yes, it's absolutely open, but it ain't easy. You know, just as that, that, that um, uh, paper that I was alluding to earlier found that a lot of people had built client side stubs for APIs incorrectly and insecurely, what we want to do is, is, is you know, give you libraries that you can go through. You can absolutely validate that these things are 100% standards-based and everything like that, but just make the life easier for developers. Because look, no app developer really wants to focus 100% on security, you know, because that's not their job. Their job is to write excellent, beautiful apps, apps that, that, that people are just delighted to use. User experience is so important on these devices. So the thing is, is that if you can give those developers libraries that just make the connection happen and they can just say, you know what, I know it's going right because it's been configured right by somebody who knows. Somebody who knows how to configure these libraries specifically so that they, you know, they're using the security policy that, that this enterprise wants to uh, put into effect. You're going to have some pretty happy developers, trust me. That's going to make their lives a lot easier. And if, if those, those libraries are just doing everything standards-based underneath the hood, even better. Because that, that really ensures that all of those connections can you know, have no proprietary dependencies what, uh, whatsoever. So, so three pieces to this, this, this whole puzzle. You know, uh, uh, basically a, uh, a mobile access gateway, which is the border guard, which handles all the security for incoming connections. You know, this idea of, a, of a, uh, an API portal, which actually goes out there and, and builds relationships with developers and manages those relationships with developers. And then finally the tools, the, the libraries that actually allow mobile app developers to, to easily and safely and securely get access into whatever backend resources they need. That's the, those are the three legs of this secure stool that hopefully you, know, you're, you can build your uh, mobile access strategy on. So, so when I opened this thing up, I said there were going to be five things. Five things you've got to do to secure mobile devices in the enterprise. 
And, and, and here they are. Here they are. So start with MDM, absolutely. You're not going to hear me coming in and saying throw MDM out because I think MDM has a place. MDM has a place for you know creating those those sort of different containers that that separation between personal and and enterprise, but you can't stop there. Okay, you still at that point then have to take that app centric, you know security stance and think about the apps and and how they interact with with um, the backends in a way that doesn't necessarily just sort of try to shove everything over one one you know supposedly secure superhighway of a VPN because I just don't think that works. Everybody you know who we come up against and, and, and talk to who's tried this just says it's a it's a difficult thing to manage in the end. So instead, integrating mobile apps and enterprise data using using APIs and and just turn on SSL everywhere. Okay, the worst thing you can do in in the API world is is make the make the mistake that APIs are just about the web. You know you know how to do gets and posts and things like that. The worst thing you can do is just you know sort of take a, a like the classic web developer approach and, and graft that onto um, mobile apps. Because the truth is, APIs are a little different, okay? APIs have different requirements, you know, different security exposure and everything like that. And in the web world, we didn't turn on SSL for everything. We only turn on SSL for, you know, the stuff that really mattered like that, that time when you're, you know, going to your shopping cart and you put in your, your credit card number. In other words, there was a very limited subset of times you, you'd flick it on. And you got to ask yourself, why was that? Because 10 years ago, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, SSL was really expensive. Like it would just bog your servers down and, and people actually bought SSL accelerator cards. But when was the last time you saw somebody buy an SSL accelerator card? I don't even think you can get them anymore. You know, they're like out there with five and a half inch disks and stuff like that. SSL is cheap on modern CPUs, you can have SSL going on all the time. Google has taught us this. Okay, Google's not afraid of SSL and neither should you be. SSL should be on all the time by default on every API call, full stop. Okay, turn it on, use it, it's your friend. But, but, make sure that you're actually configuring it right on the client side because it may not be as easy as just putting in that little S after the HTTP. Um, authenticate users and authorize apps. You need to start to think about that, that whole thing about, about expanding out your footprint into a, you know, a, um, um, a greater identity context. All of this stuff is grist for the mill and access control. And then finally, really avoid local storage. You, know, you don't need to build synchronization apps like email and stuff like that, when instead you can build apps that, you know, like a browser, get access to the information when they're live, when you need it, and then just don't keep it around anymore. Don't cache it, you know, because that's the thing that's sometimes hard to control over browsers. Just build apps that chuck it away, that, that get rid of it, and that. That's actually a really good design strategy. And if those apps are using SSL TLS to, you know, get access through a mobile access gateway into the back end, if they're using OAuth as a, as a means of authentication and authorization, so moving towards that idea of identity with, you know, identity with scale and, and identity management out to the people, the empowerment of the users themselves, you're in a pretty good stance. Okay, so these are the five things that you got to do to secure mobile devices in the enterprise. So listen, thanks a lot. I really appreciate uh, your time on this one. Um, this is, uh, if you have any other questions, here's my email address, scott at leader7.com. Um, I'm more than happy to go offline and um, you know, discuss other issues and stuff like that. Um, the Twitter hashtag's out there. If you have any other questions, fire them off to us. I'll try to get to them um, you know, offline, I'll send you some emails, um, um, you know, and, and try to answer them then. And I hope you can join me again. Uh, we're going to be doing a few other webinars coming up in the next little while. And, uh, and keep your eye on at Layer 7 on Twitter, because that's your one-stop place for information about, you know, interesting tech talks, conference appearances, all kinds of stuff, everything about Layer 7 technologies. So listen, thank you, everybody. This is Scott Morrison from Layer 7. Good night.